not tragic to die doing what you love. No one else. This is blood money. I was killed for this money. Now endorse the check. I don't know. Well, Sam, what are you going to do with it? Look over there. To your left. You don't think I'm giving this four million dollars to a bunch of nuns? Otome, if you don't do it, they will track you down. Your only protection is to get rid of it. Aw, oh, Sam, come on. You're killing me. It's four million dollars. Just think of it this way. You'll go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to storm is coming next year. 50 years storm. What's that? That's kind of a legend. No, it's real. It's absolutely real. Everything moves in cycles. So twice a century, the ocean lets us know just how small we really are. A winter storm comes out of Antarctica, tearing up the Pacific. And it sends a huge swell north 2,000 miles. And when it hits Bells Beach, it'll turn into the biggest surf this planet has ever seen, and I will be there. So will I. If you want the ultimate, you got to be willing to pay the ultimate price. Patrick Swayze has always been his own man. As early as 1979, when the former dancer and stage actor made his big screen debut in the roller disco opus Skate Town USA, Swayze easily could have let himself be packaged into that year's teen idol. But despite his cover boy looks, Swayze refused to be pigeonholed as flavor of the month and persevered as a serious actor until 1983 when Francis Ford Coppola cast him along with a crew of other unknowns with names like Tom Cruise, Emilio Estevez, and Rob Lowe in a little picture called The Outsiders. When he landed the lead in the hit miniseries North and South two years later, his stardom was solidified, and Patrick Swayze became another overnight success whose single night of paying dues lasted over a decade. Patrick Wayne Swayze was born in Houston, Texas, August 18, 1952, to Jesse Swayze, an engineer and former rancher, and Patsy Swayze, who would go on to become a world-renowned choreographer in her own right. Young Patrick was driven to be a success in everything he did, pushed by his mother in particular, excelling in sports as well as music and dance. By then, Patsy Swayze had a thriving dance studio in Houston with many attractive female students. One young lady, Lisa Nemi, caught Patrick's eye and the two were married in 1975. It proved to be one of the most enduring marriages in show business. After studying with the Harkness and Joffrey Ballet schools, Patrick went on to act in dozens of Broadway and off-Broadway shows before making the trek out to Hollywood where he and Lisa lived on, quote, a jar of peanut butter and oranges from our tree in the backyard, unquote, for more years than the actor would probably care to admit, before finally wrangling a secure career as an actor at age 30. Other notable films in the 80s included Walter Hill's Uncommon Valor and John Milius's Red Dawn. But it was the year 1987 that truly solidified Patrick Swayze's star in the Hollywood lexicon. So I did it for nothing. I hurt my family. You lost your job anyway. I did it for nothing. No, no, not for nothing, baby. Nobody has ever done anything like that for me before. You were right, Johnny. You can't win no matter what you do. You listen to me. I don't want to hear that from you. You can. I used to think so. Dirty Dancing was a small film that became a cultural phenomenon. And Patrick's turn as Catskills dance instructor Johnny Castle made young girls' hearts skip a beat, and young men by the hundreds suddenly sign up for Arthur Murray classes. The film, which was made for a meager $6 million, went on to gross over $170 million worldwide. With his name now on top of the A-list, Patrick went on to star in such films as Roadhouse, Next of Kin, and another cultural phenomenon, Ghost, in 1990. The 90s also showcased Patrick in Catherine Bigelow's Point Break, Roland Jaffe's City of Joy, Three Wishes, Green Dragon, and Donnie Darko. Patrick Swayze brought his bigger-than-life heroics to the small screen with the Hallmark Channel's production of King Solomon's Minds, based on H. Ryder Haggard's legendary pulp novel, with Patrick starring as its iconic hero, Alan Quartermain. Credited as being the inspiration for Indiana Jones, as well as dozens of other pop culture heroes, Quartermain is a 19th-century adventurer who travels to Africa in search of a missing archaeologist, 
a man who holds the key to untold treasures and power. Mr. Bitter, no animal is to be dropped unless I say so. This is my safari, Mr. Quarterman. I promised you one full-grown male, and that is what you will get, sir. Alan. Sir, I'm sorry, sir. I did not travel thousands of miles for one measly elephant. I'll take care of it, sir. Yeah. What are you doing? I need this job. He's used to getting what he wants. Not my problem. We don't make him happy. He just hires another guide. Man is not shooting females and calves when he's with me. With more and more of his kind coming out here, we could be rich. You could be rich. I could be rich. You could take proper care of your son. Don't you dare. We've got a contract, McNabb. I'll kill as many of the filthy beasts as I like. All film buffs have guilty pleasures. You know, those movies that high-minded cineasts love to turn their noses up at especially critics for the New York Times, people with MFAs in some sort of film-related field, or just plain snobs who refuse to acknowledge anything released on celluloid that doesn't have English subtitles and at least one reference to death, either as a character or a metaphor, and oftentimes both. Patrick Swayze was the undisputed king of the guilty pleasure. From his screen debut in Skate Town, USA in 1979, to his final appearance on television's The Beast as a take-no-prisoner's cop, Swayze was an unapologetic good old boy who happened to be a classically trained dancer, student of martial arts, Eastern philosophy, and possessor of an IQ that was nothing to sneeze at. In fact, he closely resembled Dalton, his character in this writer's all-time guilty pleasure, Rowdy Harrington's Roadhouse, playing a bar bouncer with a master's in philosophy from NYU who could quote Confucius and snap necks in near-perfect synchronicity. In June 2004, when I was asked by Venice Magazine to interview Swayze for his turn as pulp fiction icon Alan Quartermain in the Hallmark television production of King Solomon's Minds, his star might have waned a bit since his mid-80s heyday, but his stature as a reluctant pop-cultural icon had only increased with each passing year, and his refusal to be anything but himself. Renowned for fighting against being typecast as a typical pretty boy star leading man, Swayze's reputation indicated not only that he marched to the beat of his own drummer, but was also known for not suffering fools. That said, I didn't quite know what to expect when I went to meet Swayze at photographer Greg Gorman's studio for our sit-down. I had met more than my share of egomaniacs and narcissists in my many years of entertainment journalism, living embodiments of never-meet-your-idols. From the minute Patrick Swayze shook my hand, however, and for the next six hours we spent together, I was completely disarmed by his charm, honesty, and just plain normalcy. After half an hour or so, I felt as though I was hanging out with a buddy from the old neighborhood. His Texas to my Arizona made us cultural cousins. Swayze was reflective, yet totally unself-indulgent. He was engaging, but usually more interested in your opinion than expressing his own. He was close to the earth as a rancher and a man who loved the outdoors, yet also a man of letters who could put most PhDs to shame with his knowledge of, from what I could tell, almost everything. Tell us about wearing the shoes of Alan Quartermain, one of the first heroes of Pulp Fiction. I think any kid who's ever had an adventurous bone in their body either read Haggard's book or saw one of his film versions. It was a lot of fun for me because I felt like I was coming home, back to that kind of period hero role that I was born for. And in many ways, I lived my whole life with all the training I've done in things like martial arts, horsemanship, stunt work, and and just being a mountain man and survivalist. All these things that are passions in my life were it was great to bring me into this character. It was also an interesting choice they made, changing him from an Englishman to an American. There was a very specific reason for that, to bring it into a more contemporary feeling. King Solomon's Minds helped launch an entirely new form of storytelling that evolved into films like the Indiana Jones trilogy and Romancing the Stone, although those films were all pretty tongue-in-cheek, and I think we take it, in, I think we take it much more seriously. We wanted to create a dramatic epic that had a sense of fun. What I also wanted to try to do with it was incorporate my passion for conservation and wildlife. To have Quartermain evolve from a great white hunter into a conservationist. You spent five months in South Africa shooting the film. What were your impressions of the country? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was there once when I did a movie with my wife, Lisa, called Steel Dawn. I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people love that movie. That cracks me up. It's, it's like I'm the king of cult followings with uh, Point Break, Roadhouse next to Ken. But, but there is something about Africa. This uh, 
ancient energy that just permeates your whole being, just standing on that earth. As I was there and spending time with the lions and tigers and elephants, I, I actually became friends with this elephant named Harry that we used in the movie that was just amazing. He's the huge 15-foot elephant in the opening of the film. We actually used two elephants playing in the same part, Harry and Sally. <laughs> I, I just decided to approach this elephant the same way I do with my horses, with a lot of love and trust. It got to the point where he'd pick me up with his tusks, and I'd, I'd shake him, and he'd shake back. On my last day, I was leaving the set in this Land Rover, and I stopped the vehicle, and there was Harry. I wanted to see if he'd come to me or not, so I yelled, Harry! And he saw me, threw back his trunk, and started charging towards the vehicle. I thought, okay. So he stopped right by the vehicle, stuck his trunk inside, and wrapped it around me because he didn't want me to go. I was ready to take a big part of my ranch back home and turn it into an elephant preserve after that. Do you do most of your own stunts? Normally what I do is I let the stunt double do most of the rehearsals. The idea being that the less you do, the less chance you have of getting hurt. Although my stunt double didn't ride horses, so all the horsemanship was up to me. But most of the stunts you see in the film are done by me. It was very nice to see Allison Duty acting again. I think every man who saw her in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade has yet to catch his breath. It's a real pleasure working with a leading lady who knows exactly who she is. A lot of leading ladies, when they finally get to a certain point in their careers, get angry and have an attitude, but... Allison didn't. She was a real pro and made it safe for us both. Because she's very happily married and so am I, which helped us to establish this relationship set in the 19th century where you just didn't cross a certain line with someone you weren't married to, even though every fiber of your, of your being is screaming to. Plus, it helped us to navigate around the predictable moment of, when is this guy going to hook up with a girl? And of course, with this film... It was just that wonderful kiss between the two. Which in the 19th century was akin to a love scene. If there's one thing I've learned in any love scene I've done in a film, it's that it's not about sucking face. It's not about jumping someone's bones. It's about the connection between two human beings in the eyes. The idea that this person makes you whole and completes you. Now that's what's really sexy. And that's what makes this relationship in the film really sexy. It's all about working up to that kiss. We'd like to thank our patrons who follow us on patreon.com slash the Hollywood interview. Special thanks this week goes out to Abby Crow Rich. Abby has been brought onto the crew in the key position of gaffer because she powers us through Patreon and makes sure we have the right lighting. Thank you, Abby. You can become a patron too and enjoy the benefits of patronage with behind-the-scenes access, bonus episodes, and much, much more. Check us out at patreon.com slash The Hollywood Interview. Let's talk about your background. You were born and raised in Houston, Texas. Your mom is a legendary choreographer who started her own studio in Houston. What did your dad do? Well, his dad was one of the foremen of the King Ranch, which was the biggest ranch in the world at one point. So my dad was raised on a ranch. At any point... He was the state champion calf roper. Needless to say, he got me into this stuff from the time I was little. My dad, he he was was really really organic, kind of earthy man. He was one of those men that was full of loving energy and had a sweet, gentle nature. But he, he was also one of those men that you didn't want to cross. He had that southern man kind of energy to where if they ever lose that graciousness for one moment and that tone changes... (laughs) You better run. There's no warning. He really taught me so many things that in your younger years, you kind of cliche, but, but as you get older, you realize their importance. Like integrity, passion, in your work ethic. I now live my life by most of the things my dad taught me. I think my favorite saying of his would be, all I got is my integrity. To this day, I ain't never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. <laughs> Really, playing Alan Quartermain was an opportunity for me to play my dad. And your mother, Patsy, is a world-renowned dancer and choreographer. That's the other side of me. The intensity, the passion, the drive, the belief in communicating something through the arts. It's all these qualities of my mother's that have really led me down all these tangential paths in my life. My parents were an amazing couple. 
Your father was a man of integrity, and you seem to largely play men of integrity, going back to your character Ori Main in the miniseries North and South, the role that helped really launch your career. What sucks an audience in is that ticking clock of whether this character is going to achieve what it is that he wants in their life. And it's usually not something physical. It's usually something internal, some subtext that's eating at them or haunting them like a demon. It's a deep-seated thing that they may or may not get past in order to get what they need to achieve. Who really cares how many things you can blow up and who wins? It's how you get there. It's the process that's really the powerful thing in storytelling. You just nearly killed me being away from you. Please, we mustn't say things like that to each other. Why not? We feel them. There's nothing we can do. You don't love him. You are not his. I can never be yours. The Outsiders came out around that time and also helped to solidify your stardom. Tell us about the experience of working on that landmark Francis Coppola film, which also made stars out of a huge cast of unknowns with names like Tom Cruise, Rob Lowe, Emilio Estevez, and many others. It was wonderful. Playing Ori really graduated me into playing the role of Daryl Curtis. And Francis was a great teacher for me. What I got from Francis was the true essence of what organic means. He would have us live in the house as a family and be brothers. I would teach these kids how to jump freight trains and ride them. I used to jump freights in my surfing days when I'd jump a freight leaving Houston for the Gulf Coast and then jump another one to go home. I taught all these kids all the skills I knew, how to fight, how to do backflips and handstands. I was teaching gymnastics classes to all the guys every day. The only one who was too cool to work with us was Matt Dillon. <laughs> he, was, he was more into, uh, I'm a New Yorker, I ain't into all that stuff. That's pussy stuff. <laughs> But Cruz took it like a magnet. That's what I love about Tom. Same thing with John Travolta. I love guys who are sponges. No attitude, just I want to learn. And if you look at them now, those are the guys that have careers. When you come from I don't know, your growth is limitless. When you come from I know, your growth stops. But Francis got so detailed. He didn't want anything coming out that didn't come from you as a person. No play acting, no doing words. We rehearsed that film completely improvisationally. We really became the family of three boys who were too young to be left alone. But we had no choice because our parents were dead. And we had to survive. And we had to maintain our dignity. If there's a common thread among all the characters I played, I think it's the exploration of all our dignity as people. Where the hell have you been? Do you know what time it is? Well, it's two o'clock in the morning, kiddo. Hey, Pony, where have you been? I fell asleep in the lot. You what? I was talking to Johnny and I fell asleep in the lot. I didn't mean to. Yeah? Hey, and I can't even call the cops because you two would be thrown in a boy's home so fast it would make your head spin. So Francis became a huge part of my life. We were all together at his winery up in Napa in the 20th anniversary of the film and the director's cut that was coming out on DVD. And it was like old home week. It was like my father was in my life again. Francis will always be an inspiration to me because he never gives up. Nobody puts baby in a corner. With Dirty Dancing, did you and the rest of the cast and crew have any clue that the film would become the phenomenon that it did? Everyone always wants to say in hindsight, oh yeah, I knew it all along. But Dirty Dancing was another one of those situations where we were just rewriting constantly. Eleanor Bergstein, Emil Ardolino, and I around the clock. When you find one of those projects where everyone jumps in with both feet, for me, those are the movies that make history. Dirty Dancing had that kind of energy. I would say it's the only film in my life that made me realize I had to keep my dancing quiet. Because if dancing had been the thing that launched me initially, I would have always been that dancer turned actor and never been taken seriously as an actor. But what made that movie famous wasn't me shaking my butt. It was the fact that the young, funky Jewish girl gets the guy not because she's the hottest girl on the block, but because of what she's got in her heart. That's what's worth falling in love with. I truly believe that's why that movie continues to live on, like Ghost. I never used to believe in luck before. But when I think back in some of the films I've done, there's got to be a little luck in there somewhere, you know? I mean, who gets to be involved with one movie that makes history... (laughs) It, it's, it's that mythical law of the chance that Buddhists talk about called Miyoho. Sorry about the disruption, folks. 
But I always do the last dance of the season. But this year, somebody told me not to. So I'm going to do my kind of dancing with a great partner, who's not only a terrific dancer, but somebody who's taught me that there are people willing to stand up for other people, no matter what it costs them. Somebody who's taught me about the kind of person I want to be. Miss Frances Hausman. Sit down, Jake. Let's talk about some of your other films. One of your earliest films I really liked was Walter Hill's Uncommon Valor with Gene Hackman. I came from a place where I wanted to be a part of a collaborative, nurturing kind of energy. A lot of times you'll have actors who just want to phone it in until they're close up or just phone it in when they're off camera. And Gene never did that. It didn't matter if he had an attitude about something that had made him angry on the set. Always with the other actor. He was there 100% for you emotionally, no matter which side of the camera he was on. That made me realize that was the kind of actor I wanted to be. I always been very lucky with those kinds of people. Congratulations, sailor. You just wasted a prisoner. It's a collaborator. <laughs> the only bad thing I can say about Patrick Swayze, God damn, did he smoke a lot. Patrick must have gone through at least a pack and a half, a conservative estimate, of American spirits during our talk. The only time he wasn't smoking, in fact, was when we were eating a magnificent sushi dinner. The minute those chopsticks went down, a lit nail was back in his hand. I knew he'd gotten sober after an ongoing battle with the bottle, one that had claimed both his father and his sister, but cigarettes continued to be a demon he wrestled with. When I asked him about the irony of such a fine athlete destroying his lungs with tobacco smoke, he smiled gently, looked at the cigarette in his hand, and said, Yeah, I know, man. But I'll beat this thing eventually. I've beaten worse, man. He had, and for a while, he nearly did. Okay, now we have to talk about Roadhouse, which might be my favorite film of yours. Your character Dalton wasn't really the typical action hero. He was far more complex. Yeah, the, the whole basis of Roadhouse was a modern-day Western, with the lead character being quite a complicated man. It would have been very simple to go down the road of playing tough and acting intense, but just playing tough guy never really goes anywhere. It might go somewhere for a little bit in a certain genre of film, but then people get tired of that genre and tired of that actor. I'll give you a local. No, thank you. Do you enjoy pain? Pain don't hurt. This was going to be possibly the one real fight film I did where a lifetime of training I'd gone through would be able to be put into one movie. In the fight scenes, none of us were pulling our punches, except for the ones to the face. We made sure that everyone who was fighting really knew how to fight, so that you'd lift people off the ground, but you didn't break a bone. We wanted to avoid the stuntman, biff, bam, bop thing. In certain ways, I saw Dalton as Shane. I liked the fact that this was one of the first opportunities for me to put out there my passion for being a peaceful warrior. To be highly skilled, but to avoid violence or hurting another human being at all costs, unless you have no choice. But my complete concern in that film was to focus on the performance, and the fighting was secondary. All you have to do is follow three simple rules. One, never underestimate your opponent. Expect the unexpected. Two, take it outside. Never start anything inside the bar unless it's absolutely necessary. And three, be nice. The thing that continues to amaze me about Roadhouse is the huge cult following it has, not, not only with male viewers, but with women as well. I guess it's the whole idea of the man who's really mush inside. Women want men to get more sensitive than they do when women write songs like, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? <laughs> do you ever win a fight? Nobody ever wins a fight. Speaking of chick flicks, let's talk about Ghost. That, for me, was another testament that when you get people believing they're doing something special, something special happens. Jerry Zucker, being renowned for his comedic work, brought a wonderful thing to this project. And the writer, Bruce Joel Rubin, was a real gift because Bruce was a very spiritual man. When we'd be talking about doing the rewrites, we'd go into deeper topics about spirituality. But we finally came up with the idea that if you truly love someone and then you die, you take that love with you. 
because that's all you can really take. By curbing the desire to try to say too much, and thus possibly alienating people, and going back to very simple truths, it just seemed to resonate with a lot of people around the world. It was one of those films that come along and an alarm goes off in my body, telling me that I have to do this. It passed what I call the goosebump test. When that happens, I know I have to do a film. Swayze's self-described peaceful warrior attitude allowed him to survive nearly two years longer than doctors predicted he would after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He lost that battle on Monday, September 14th, 2009. He was 57. At the end of our talk, Patrick took my hand in his and said, Alex, I'd really like you to stay in my life. Over the next few years, we shared some nice chats over the phone, a few emails, and almost worked together when Patrick read the script for my AFI graduate thesis film, a Hollywood satire, and loved the part of an arrogant movie star. Scheduling conflicts dictated this collaboration was not to be, however, and eventually we lost touch, as people tend to do in Los Angeles. As Raymond Chandler wrote in The Long Goodbye, to say goodbye is to die a little. Goodbye, Patrick. Thank you for always staying down to earth, even when Hollywood tried to cast you out among the stars. It's amazing, Molly. The love inside. Take it with you. Love the interaction we've been having with our audience. Feel free to reach out to us on Facebook at The Hollywood Interview. And of course, please go to Apple Podcasts and rate us with a five-star rating and also a good review. It all really helps. Patrick Swayze was voiced by Ben Warner. Ben is an actor, producer, and comedian. Visit Ben at the Ben Warner at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and thebenwarner.com. This has been a production of No One Else Media and Wanderer Productions.